Hi, my name is Carol. I am a computer scientist. I am creative. And I am a woman. These three things are not mutually exclusive. I've been researching robotics for the past 15 years. And I work on the human side of robotics and how to save humanity. Too often, the media tells the story of a robot uprising, instilling fear in our society. I think that the future generation of engineers needs to stem from play with technology instead of through fear. My specialty is in teleoperation. This means that a human is controlling a machine at a distance. It could be across the room, it could be across the world, it can even be in outer space. I've been extremely interested in applying this technology in various applications. I started my research in underwater robotics, uh, finding test tubes at the bottom of Lake Tahoe. And then I worked at Lockheed Martin in space systems. Um, I then researched um, haptic uh, technologies, which means the sense of touch in robotics. So how much force would you need to apply to pick up something as delicate as an egg? And I spent the last 10 years working in surgical robotics. My graduate work at Johns Hopkins University and Intuitive Surgical is in designing the next generation of surgical systems. Isn't it interesting that designing robotics for humans has taught me what it means to be human? It's made me understand the complexity of our minds, our social interactions with people, and it's also made me very aware of our limitations and our vulnerabilities. In my world, robots and humans work together, and we have different strengths and different weaknesses. I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, how robots and humans can work together. This won the Robot Film Festival People's Choice Awards in 2011. How many of you guys remember the game Operation? Yeah. It was the ultimate test for a surgeon's skill level. And this is one example of how technology might be able to help. Meet the Da Vinci system. It's made by Intuitive Surgical and is a $2 million robot. It's a teleoperated system, which means that the surgeon sits on one end of the room and the patient and the robot are on the other side. Instead of a large incision, you now make several small five to eight millimeter incisions. You're essentially giving a surgeon superhuman capabilities. They now have motion scaling so that they can do uh, extremely precise motion. There's also enhanced 3D views so that they can see things up close. There's also a low pass filter to reduce hand tremor. Imagine the possibilities for telesurgery. <laughs> so as interesting as this technology was, the $2 million price point made me realize that this was only for the elite. And I really wanted to design healthcare for everybody at an affordable uh, price point. So I became involved with the maker movement. The maker movement is a community of do-it-yourselfers, people who are interested in making things. So here are several of the projects I had worked on. Uh, one was a hack to the game Guitar Hero, where we mapped the EKG signals on your forearms and to the buttons on the guitar so that you can essentially play Air Guitar Hero. <laughs> Another project I worked on was a low-cost do-it-yourself blood pressure monitor system for third world countries. Working on all these projects made me have a playful relationship with technology again, it made me explore different sensors, and made me able to try new things. I also wanted to help kids understand the practical application of real-world uh, situations through engineering. I organized a robotics challenge where um, the kids used Lego Mindstorms to find a tumor inside of a patient, which was actually a grape embedded in jello. And um, what was amazing to me was that a few hours of working on these type of challenges made kids who had no idea what engineering was, made them want to major in engineering and find out more about coding. And this made me think back on my own childhood and what made me want to become an engineer. I grew up in a small town in Washington State, and I had no idea what engineering was. I didn't code growing up. I didn't play with electronics growing up. But there was the internet and the personal computer revolution. And so this made me feel like I could connect with anyone in the world. And as much as I loved playing on the internet and living in the digital world, I really wanted to make things for the physical world. 
And robotics was a chance to do that. It bridged the digital and physical world together and was a way to help people. So when I went off to college, I had no idea that there was this huge problem in tech. Women make up 50% of the world's population and only 12% of engineers. We need to have a voice in what our future looks like. We need to design from a female perspective. Women consume more technology. They use social media more. They install more apps. So we really need to change this ratio. So when I started researching why aren't girls majoring in engineering, why aren't they interested in becoming scientists, I found that it wasn't an intelligence issue, it was a confidence issue. And this might be one reason why. In our society, little girls strive to be little Miss Perfect. And it's a side effect. They become more afraid to make mistakes, to try new things, to get out of their comfort zone. And this has a lasting impact on our ability to cope with failure, the ability to be bold and ask for equal pay, our ability to become entrepreneurs. Another reason could be the lack of role models. You can't be what you can't see. Did you guys know that the first computer scientist was a female? Yeah. <laughs> this is Lady Ada Lovelace. She was the daughter of famous poet Lord Byron. Um, she thought that coding was beautiful and creative and a form of self-expression. And she really lived at the intersection of humanities and math. My first coding class was the first day in college. And it was a little bit unfair because I was put in a class where people were coding at a younger age. But I stuck with it and ended up loving engineering. It was fun and creative and beautiful. And it gave me the tools to invent whatever I thought of in my head and also to solve problems that I cared about. So this made me realize that coding is the new literacy of the 21st century. And most of us are computer illiterate. We need to start teaching coding at a younger age. And it shouldn't be the first day of college. So this compelled me to start Squishy Bots, which is the fun, lovable side of robotics and tech. And this is kind of the way that I see engineering. My mission is to prepare kids for jobs that don't currently exist. Surgical robotics was not a field when I was growing up and wasn't something I wanted to be when I, since I was a little girl. And I think a lot of people might not know what they want to be, and that might be because your job doesn't exist yet. You might need to invent it yourself. Coding is the fastest growing job and one of the highest paying, and there's not enough engineers. Meet Ada Beta. This is one of the characters in the book. This and her sidekick, Squishy. Um, this is part interactive. Uh, toys and also a book series. And it's really American Girl meets Wally. -E. And I want to teach kids how to hack their toys and how to really make and um, have a playful relationship with tech. So, who are our future generation of engineers? It shouldn't be for the elite, it should be the boys, it could be the girls, it could be the hackers, it could be the makers. Coding really needs to be accessible to anybody. If you're going to learn a language, instead of Spanish and French, learn C++. <laughs> My future has always involved robotics. And I hope that whatever future you imagine, it's one that you build yourselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm.